Hi everyone, I'm Chong Mimi from UCSI University and this is a video presentation for chemical and process design and optimization. So we are group 6, we have a project title called Production of Ethyl Benzene and these are my group members, Chao Kajun, Hari Prashan, Ng Chung Kwan and Yap Kuni. So in this um, presentation, we will cover chapter 1 to chapter 5, where I will cover chapter 1 called the Sustainable and Feasibility Study. So in chapter 1, before we go into detail of Sustainable and Feasibility Study, here we will talk about the introduction of ethyl benzene, where ethyl benzene is actually a colorless compound and it has an odor similar to gasoline. And ethyl benzene can actually be found in petroleum and it has 2% in the gasoline which explains its odor. So ethyl benzene is a, has a high inflammability property which makes it um, easily evaporate in room temperature and in atmosphere it appears in the form of vapor. So ethyl benzene has high mobility between water and soil so with enough concentration it do actually react with atmosphere in order to cause harm to the environment and human health. So EB is mostly used in the production of styrene which is further processed into polystyrene and rubber and other electrical components. So in 2021, they do predict that the Asia-Pacific being the top country to consume the highest ethyl benzene and as well as producing it. So in the environmental aspect of the sustainability study, we do say that the raw material and the product do not have enough, high con do not have enough concentration to actually react with the atmosphere in, in causing harm to the environment. The raw material here is the benzene and ethylene and the product is the ethyl benzene. So in economical aspect, there's a study saying that EB is actually predicted to increase in the market by 4% by the year of 2021 according to the compound annual growth rate. So with increasing demand, the manufacturers do increase their production rate in order to cover up the demand of the rest of the world. So with this, we actually found that by controlling the raw material inlet to 8 to 1, 8 being the benzene, 1 being the ethylene, they do produce higher purity of ethyl benzene which then generate higher income for the um, company, higher profit. So there's also a side product called diethyl benzene and this can be recycled back to react with benzene in order to produce 2 molar of ethyl benzene which has a higher production rate of ethyl benzene. So when it comes to high manufacturing company to cover the demand of the world, more job opportunities can be provided to the local as well as foreigners. And taking Top Glove Malaysia as an example, they do provide accommodation for the workers in order for them to have ease of transportation between work and home. And here, the workers' housing and infrastructure services will also be provided by the company. And because Malaysia has DOSH, Department of Safety and Health of Workers, the safety of workers are actually protected. So in conclusion of chapter 1, ethyl benzene can be said that it is sustainable because of its insufficient concentration to react with the atmosphere to produce any harm towards the environment and with the controlled um, inlet of raw materials and also the recycling of diethyl benzene can actually produce more profit for the manufacturers and with expanding manufacturers there's also more job opportunities for people closing the gap of poor and rich in a certain country so from there their house and infrastructure are also provided and their safety is also protected so this is the end of chapter one next i'll pass to Hari Prashan to talk more in chapter two thank you now i'll be talking about the two for the production of Benzene. As you can see here, there are three possible reactions to produce ethyl benzene. The first reaction is acceleration of benzene with ethylene. The second reaction is acceleration of benzene with chloroethylene. And the third is the reduction of acetophenol to ethyl benzene. Now, I'll be comparing the advantages and disadvantages of the three reaction pathways to determine which is the most suitable reaction pathway. So, for the first pathway, you can see the advantage is high ethyl benzene speed of more than 99%. However, the disadvantage is the handling and disposal of aluminum chloride catalyst is costly and complicated due to environmental considerations. For the second pathway, the advantage is high ethyl benzene yield of 95% and the valuable co products, which is the hydrochloric acid. However, hydrochloric acid is a corrosive byproduct and they need an additional recovery process to recover hydrochloric acid. 
therefore increasing, increasing operating costs. For the third pathway, there is only one advantage, the selectivity of the catalyst to the ether benzene. It is above 90% of the reaction, thus allowing conversion of ether benzene to remain high. However, there are many disadvantages as you can see here, primarily being low ether benzene yield of 45% and the cost of anhydrous hydrazine is expensive. Now we will be comparing the three reaction pathway in terms of gross profit. Reaction pathway 1 is the only pathway that gives us the positive job, while reaction pathway 2 and 3 gives us a significant loss. After taking all of that into consideration, we chose the reaction pathway 1 because it is the most profitable pathway compared to the reaction pathway 2 and 3. Furthermore, reaction pathway 1 gives us a higher ethyl benzene yield of 99% compared to 95% and 45%. There are also no byproducts of with the reaction pathway 1. We then came up with the base case design. Recycled benzene is mixed with fresh benzene which is then pumped to get the pressure up to 20 bars and then heated up to temperature of 400 degrees Celsius. Benzene is then mixed with a side stream of ethylene and the combined stream is used as feed for the first reactor. Output of the reactor is then mixed with a side stream of more ethylene before cooling down and back into the second reactor. This process is repeated for the third reactor. The cooling process before the reactor, as you can see here, is to cool down the output of each reactor since the reaction is extremely exothermic. Thus, lower temperature favors the reaction. The product from the final reactor is then cooled down before being fed to a separator to separate the fuel gas which is mostly contains inert ethane. The liquid stream from the separator is then fed to two distillation columns in series. The first separates diethyl benzene as the bottom product. The second column separates benzene which is then recycled and the main product ethyl benzene as the bottom product. From this configuration, we managed to achieve a predictive ethyl benzene of 87.25%. We also integrated several heuristics when designing the base case. The first heuristic is lighting chemical reactions to reduce handling and storage of toxic chemicals. For reaction pathway 2, chloroethane is an extremely flammable liquid which will produce hydrochloric acid when reacted with water. For reaction pathway 3, your hydrogen is an extremely unstable substance and is also a toxic chemical. Therefore, we chose reaction pathway 1 because it is the safest to work with. For heuristic 2, we use excess of benzene or maybe consume our valuable reactant which is ethylene as you can see here. Ethylene costs almost double compared to benzene, so we made sure that benzene was in excess to completely ensure ethylene was completely consumed during the reaction. For heuristic 9 and 10, we conduct the vapor mixture using cooler to bring out the temperature before we use a separator to separate the mixture. Last but not least, for heuristic 16, to increase the pressure of steam, we pump a liquid rather than compressed gas to increase the cost effectiveness. As you can see here, the utility cost for heating and compressing when total up is 5,655 kW, while the cost for pumping and heating up is 4,310 kW. So this gives us a difference of 1,554 kW, which you can take. Hello everyone, my name is Yakuni. Uh, I'm going to talk for chapter 3, which separation trend synthesis. There are two methods used in this chapter, which qualitative method and quantitative method. Qualitative method is the heuristic method, where quantitative method is minimal repro for we mean. There are total five products have been produced in this production, ethylene, ethane, benzene, ethyl benzene, diethyl benzene. So due to the low flow rate of the component A and B, which is lesser than 1 kg mole per hour, so it will be assumed negligible and will be separated along C to save the operation and installation cost. So next, this equation will be used to calculate the separation column. So there are two separation columns will be used, thus there will only be two sequences. So there are the sequence for the qualitative method, which is also heuristic method. There are six rules in the heuristic method. Which heuristic 2, 3, 4, and 5 will be applied in the separation? For heuristic 2, which is removed by following the direct sequence, so the components A, B, and C will be removed at the first stage, and component D and E will be removed at the second stage. And heuristic 3, which remove the greater smaller percentage early in the sequence. As component A and B had been negligible, so uh, component C will be removed and followed by component D and E removed at the second column. So for heuristic 4, which remove the low volatility at last. So based on this table, 
we have found out that component D and E had the lowest volatility. Hence, it will be removed at the second column of the production, which in the sequence one here. And then for the heuristic five is remove the highest purity product at the last. So as component D is the final product, eta benzene, so it should be the highest purity and will be removed at the last, which is here for the component D. And so sequence one had been chosen for the heuristic method. Next is the quantitative method which is minimum repro for V minimum. Underwood method had been used for this method. So there are two formula. We apply the this formula to find the phi and then we substitute into the formula for V minimum. And next for the sequence one, here are the calculation. So we have find the phi one, we choose the 9.141 which in the range and then we sub into the V minimum to find the V minimum one. And for I2, we use 1.063, which in the range of 1 and 5.65. And we substitute into the V minimum two. So for the V total minimum of the sequence one is 216.206 kg mole per hour. So here's the summary. And for sequence 2 of the V minimum, the total of V minimum will be 256.598 kg mole per hour. So, from the total minimum vapor flow, sequence 1 had been selected due to the lowest minimum vapor flow. So, uh, based on the qualitative and quantitative method, sequence 1 will be the most suitable sequence for this separation process. Thank you. Hello everyone, my name is Eun Chun Kong. I will present the chapter 4 for process optimization. For process optimization, there are generally two parts. One is topological optimization, another one is parametric optimization. For the parametric optimization is to adjust the operating variables to improve the operating functions. The operating variables could be adjust the temperature, pressure, flow, or number of trays. So for in this chapter, there are two parts that we are focusing, which are split optimization and refrigeration optimization. In the first part of split optimization, we try to op optimize the split of the feed ethylene before it enters the reactor. As you can see from this PFD, the feed ethylene has to go through two coolers for entering the reactors. This is because the reaction is exothermic, which favors lowest temperature. So in this scenario, our objective function is to reduce cost in cooler utility. So before the optimization, we also need to consider the constraint it takes. In this scenario, there is the possibility of side reaction. The production of diethylbenzene is undesired. That's why we want to minimize this side reaction. We need to set a constraint. So to minimize this variation, the ratio of the ethylene to benzene need to be kept low. This means that in one stream of the ethylene, you cannot have too much of the molar flow. So we, we set our constraint as one stream cannot more than 40 kmol per hour of ethylene. And we assume the cooling utility is 0 0.5 per kilowatt. We set out our objective function and constraint like so. So this one, the E102 and E103 is the coolers in use and it represent the duty and multiply by the price so we can actually start optimizing using unisim in the unisim optimizer you open up from here uh, first you set out your variables as so and next you set the spreadsheet you put all the utility by inputting the variable from the cooler you want and also set out multiply by the cost and you get this is the total cost so in the function you want to minimize the cost which is here before and you want all this thing, all this flow rate, lesser than your constraint. So now you can start to optimize. You, first, you have to enable any of the two streams. Then you start. Yeah, so there's the result. 38 by 75, 35, and 36 by 25. As you can see from the summary, the changes is like so. And the total cost reduction is 16.5, which is not very, very high. This is because we consider the constraint we take that we shouldn't have more than 40 kilomole per hour 
so it kind of limits the way we optimize it. So for next one, we will try to optimize the reflux ratio for the two distillation column. So this is the objective function. 0 by 5 is for condenser and R is for reviser. We put our constraint as the purity. For benzene, we need to have more than 90% of purity and for ethyl benzene, we need to have more than 90% of purity. Actually, we can uh, optimize using Unisim again. For the first column, we try to minimize the cost, which is V4 over here, and we need to set a constraint, D5, the purity must be greater than 97%. So we enable this one, the first one, and try to start, and we get a value. So for another one, we set the cost, V1, which is this one, and the cell is D9 and D10, more than the constraint, and put the variable and run. Yeah, you get this value. So the value is around this one. As you can see from the summary, the, the cost reduction is 378, and another one is 329. This one is more significant than the other one. So in conclusion, in ethylene split, the cost isn't very significant due to the constraint we set, the white side reaction. And for the second one, the refract ratio, we get a more significant result while maintaining the purity that we want. So that's all for me. Thank you. Chao Kajun, and I would like to talk to you about heat and energy integration. Now, the first part we are going to talk about PTA method, which is the problem table algorithm to determine the pinch point. And then we'll talk about the heat exchanger network, which is the grid diagram. And then from there, we work out the minimum heat exchange, number of heat exchanger, and also how do we break the heat loops. Now, this is the PFD of ethyl benzene production. Now, I'll skip to the part where we identify all the streams. So, in PTA, we are going to assume a T minimum of 10 degrees Celsius. So, the correction factor here is the 5 degrees Celsius, T minimum divided by 2. So, hot stream needs to be reduced by 5 degrees Celsius and cold stream needs to be increased by 5 degrees Celsius. So, these are the new set of temperature, as you can see. And then, this is the delta H, which is gotten from the heater and cooler duty. And from these two information, we can also calculate the CP. Now, this is the PTA table where we plot all the new set of temperature here. And the stream, temp stream population, we plot it as arrows. So, um, going up is cold, going down is hot, as denoted by C1 and H1 and so on. So, this column is the temperature difference. This column is the difference between the total CP of the hot stream minus the cold stream. Now, from these two information, we can get the delta H. So, this new delta H should be used in the heat cascade of PTA. So, as you can see in the first iteration, this is the new set of delta H. So, for the first iteration, we'll start by a zero. And then we'll add the middle, um, the value in the middle column to get the subsequent value and so on. So, in the first iteration, we'll take the most negative value, which is this, and use it as the value, starting value of second iteration. Now, take note that we only take the magnitude, not the negative. Now, we'll do the same thing, and you should get a zero value in the second iteration. This point identifies the temperature for the pinch point. Now, we need to apply back the correction factor, which is 5 degrees Celsius. So, hot stream will, be, will need to be added by 5, as we minus 5 just now. And then the cold stream will, be, will need to be uh, reduced by 5. So 152.1 and 142.1 is the pinch temperature for stream and cold stream respectively. Now from the PTA table, we can also get the hot utility and cold utility, which is this value. And we can also get the recovery heat um, when we are using this heat cascade. So this delta HC is actually the total delta H of cold streams. So when applying this formula, you can get this value. Now, this is the grid diagram or heat exchanger network. So, uh, I'm sorry, I have to skip the part where I, I go one by one for the heat configuration because of time constraint. So, I'll jump straight to why I split these two into two streams because um, this CP hot is actually more than this CP cold which violates the above pinch rule. So, when I split it, it will be divided by two. Now, there are two heat loops here which we can combine into one heat exchanger. From the grid diagram, we can find that the total utility is 
while the utility from the PFD generated by Unisim is 15.6. Therefore, the utility that we can save is actually 12.7 megawatts. That's all for me. Thank you very much.